This is a Course in Miracles. It is a required course. Only the time you take it is voluntary. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. It means only that you can elect what you want to take at a given time. The course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. This course can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. A reading from Chapter 12, The Holy Spirit's Curriculum. Section 7, Looking Within. Paragraph 1. Miracles demonstrate that learning has occurred under the right guidance. For learning is invisible, and what has been learned can be recognized only by its results. Its generalization is demonstrated as you use it in more and more situations. You will recognize that you have learned there is no order of difficulty in miracles when you apply them to all situations. There is no situation to which miracles do not apply. And by applying them to all situations, you will gain the real world. For in the, this holy perception, you will be made whole, and the atonement will radiate from your acceptance of it for yourself to everyone the Holy Spirit sends you, for your blessing. In every child of God, his blessing lies. And in your blessing of the children of God is his blessing to you. When I was at the uh, Ringling School of Art and Design, teaching in their interior design department, we had to do a workshop. And in that workshop, he told us that learning, I think he said, is 85% situation specific. In other words, if you learn something in a classroom, there's a strong possibility you will only be able to use it in a classroom. Oh, interesting. So, so that where you learn it, that's why the course is talking about generalizing. So, so that, that you, you apply it to all everywhere. situations all So the right time. now we're sitting at, at a table and we can do this thing and we've got this book in front of us, but the course is suggesting that you get so conversant with the lessons that you apply them in every situation. And um, I could say that I do not do this. <laughs> and um, the, the lessons today require us to do, uh, uh, you know, a mo- you know I, what I would call the mantra of the day every hour. And um, that does bring me back. And every time we end up with that kind of situation where there's an every hour or where you have to return to or every half hour, um, it helps to keep my mind on it. And um, I appreciate it no matter how many times I think, oh, God, I failed today because I only got in this many times. Well, you know, line, line one here, miracles demonstrate that learning has occurred under the right guidance. For learning is invisible, and what has been learned can be recognized only by its results. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is so insanely logical. You've got to listen to it. It's like, how do you know if you learn something? It's in the course. It's miracles. Yes. That's how you know you learned something. Now, how do you know that you're seeing a miracle? How? Because it generates the sense of love, peace, or joy with you and the other. Usually there's both happen at the same time. I mean, it might not be exactly at the same time, but there is no disturbance in the field, I would say. Well, I don't want to name names here, uh, but we have had, call it an intention going. Mm -hmm. And this morning, we got verification. I got a text this morning. This is happening so frequently. I agree. And that, and that you start to almost, it, it, it's a sense of amazement. Yeah. You know, starting to recognize miracles, starting to recognize the messages that the universe gives back to me when I'm doing, when I'm learning. It's not going to let you learn stuff and not tell you you're learning it. I agree. 
I agree, one hundred percent. That's the nature of it. It's yeah. intelligence. See, mm-hmm. we're so accustomed to. Did I know whether I learned it or not? Well, you got to take a test and see if you get an eighty-five or a hundred-five or ninety. You know, you get a little fruit basket taped to the top of your <laughs> gold star. You know, on the top of your paper. Uh-huh. That's what the teacher tells you. Mm-hmm. Well, the teacher here is giving, throwing you miracles. Yes, and then so that you gratitude know. and thankfulness. You have to recognize these You have to recognize it. Yes, I agree. Paragraph two. Everyone in the world must play his part in its redemption in order to recognize that the world has been redeemed. You cannot see the invisible. Yet if you see its effects, you know it must be there. By perceiving what it does, you recognize its being. And by what it does, you learn what it is. You cannot see your strengths but you gain confidence in their existence as they enable you to act. And the results of your actions, you can see. So well, you, yeah, that's, go- yeah, that's definitely verification there. Yeah, and I would say that we, um, it's kind of covered in the both of those. So let's go ahead and read one more paragraph here. Paragraph three, the Holy Spirit is invisible but you can see the results of his presence and through them you will learn that he is there. What he enables you to do is clearly not of this world. For miracles violate every law of reality as this world judges it. Every law of time and space, of magnitude and mass is transcended. For what the Holy Spirit enables you to do is clearly beyond all of them. Perceiving his results, you will understand where he must be and finally know what he is. Well, this paragraph shows that, I mean, we are dealing with entirely different levels of, um, well, just levels of, I would call it reality, but one is not real, one is real, of perceptual uh, understandings. And also that it says that every law of reality as this world judges it is violated through the way the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit does not use time, does not use space, does not use mass. It transcends all of these things. And yet, we totally will recognize when that miracle, it's an internal recognition that um, a loving thought has generated a loving effect, you might say. Well, people living in a, po- in a, in a post-hypnotic uh, suggestion type trance, in other words, I rationalize my world to me to conform to what I already believe about the world. That's like a post that's like post hypnotic suggestion of trance where you know you will behave like a chicken, then you behave like a chicken and then you rationalize to yourself, why am I behaving like a chicken? Well, I just love chickens. You know, you you make up reasons to yourself mm-hmm. of why you're doing that. This is the the sort of the enemy of recognizing miracles. In other words, that you, you can't rationalize them. You, you, and so in a way, you have to say in advance, if this is a miracle, you choose a hopeless case. You, you choose, choose something that's impossible. Choose something, you know, I mean, not totally turning things upside down, but in the case of the text that I received, I have to admit that... Uh, I'd say a month ago, this particular situation, I would have put in the category of pretty much lost cause. I agree. Lost cause. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. no, it's not a lost cause. Mm-hmm. There's things happening there. No, There's no. vitality and movement, and it's going somewhere. But, you it know, so I say, well, I was wrong about the lost cause. Or yeah. are we all healed together? I would That's say the deal. Yeah, we're all healed together. So you can't say, well, look what I did. No, you no. say we're, there's an upsurgence. Right. Of yeah. everyone, everyone, they're, they're all moving far upward, upward in this movement. Mm-hmm. It's important to recognize that that is, in fact, what's happening. Right. Yeah, All you recognize a miracle because all persons involved in the situation where, that we thought was particular to one person. Everybody's happy. Everybody's happy. Everybody's happy. Absolutely. Okay, paragraph four. You cannot see the Holy Spirit but you can see his manifestations. And unless you do, you will not realize he is there. Miracles are his witnesses and speak for his presence. 
What you cannot see becomes real to you only through the witnesses that speak for it. For you can be aware of what you cannot see, and it can become compellingly real to you as its presence becomes manifest through you. Do the Holy Spirit's work, for you share in his function. As your function in heaven is creation, so your function on earth is healing. God shares his function with you in heaven, and the Holy Spirit shares his with you on earth. As long as you believe you have other functions, so long will you need correction. For this belief is the destruction of peace, a goal in direct opposition to the Holy Spirit's purpose. And I would say it's not necessarily, it's not like it's hard. It's not the proverbial rocket science. It's this. Well, today's affirmation, I think, was uh, heaven is the decision I must make. Yes. Is the lesson. Um, That means that in every moment, in every juncture of what you would call choice, that's washing the dishes, walking out of the house, it's going to get gas, Mm -hmm. it's doing a project, it's musing, looking out the window. It's hooking up Christmas lights. Yeah, hooking up Christmas lights. (laughs) Heaven is the decision I must make. Yes. But then what does that mean? Does it mean you're trying to go to heaven? No, it's an upward looking. Mm-hmm. It's a decision I must make. In other words, I have to orient myself towards this thing called heaven. What's heaven? Heaven is the opposite of uh, the nightmare. Heaven in, is, is toward the happy dream, right? Absolutely. So we're orienting towards the happy dream as opposed to grim reality. Mm-hmm. Grim reality is sold to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sold and, to us and, every and, moment. And you have to say, I will not do grim reality. Mm-hmm. Why? Because it's just a choice. It's a choice I have to make. It doesn't mean I'm going to live in la la land. Mm-hmm. It just means in every circumstance, if I feel myself sinking, you know, like what was that movie where the, the guy's on the unicorn or the, the white horse and he sinks into the, the swamp, the nothing or whatever? The, the ever the never ending story. Oh, okay. Yeah. In the movie, the never ending oh, right, story, right. it's this it's the swamp of of something. Oh yeah. But it's depression, and the poor horse, the kid's on the horse, and the horse is sinking, sinking, mm-hmm. sinking, in this depressive, burdensome re- uh, reality that he's in. So the everything about the swamp sucks the enthusiasm, the strength, the life out of you. Mm-hmm. And in there, the kid is realizing, with or without his horse, you know, he has to choose. Because if you don't choose heaven, mm-hmm. you sink into the nightmare. Grim realities multiply, Yes. as do the choice for heaven. Mm-hmm. So, anyway. Well, it speaks of these witnesses, and we, we, we mentioned that, and the witnesses are the effects of um, extending loving thoughts towards situations, people, the world, and um, do the Holy Spirit's work for you share in his function. And I like this, this uh, number seven there, as your function in heaven is creation, so your function on earth is healing. Implying that the only creation you can do here is healing this situation we're in. Healing, there is no creativity here mm-hmm. short of Healing is the most creative response we can make. Right. And healing is... And I always heal myself first. Yes. Yes. And the definition of healing is, um, well, how would you explain it? It is where I recognize my uh, oneness with God and I... Forgiving all projections. Absolutely. Okay, in the case of this person that I'm talking about, the text, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of which I don't want to name names, Mm -hmm. uh, in this text... I thought that this this situation could not arise. I, I just think I thought it was structurally impossible for this thing to arise. That's judgment. Right. I'm placing limits. Now mm-hmm. the miracle is, watch me shatter your opinion. Watch mm-hmm. me shatter your mm-hmm. judgment about what's possible. Well, and you would have to have suspended some of your judgments through prayer and extension, you know, towards the situation, and then. Let it go, because you're asking for help. No, well, you've got to go for healing, but the healing, again, is first me healing 
my ability to see change. You know, yes. instead of just saying, okay, this person is doomed to go through the life in this certain way that this person is going through their life. Mm -hmm. Name the person. And I just say, with from my almighty enlightened chair, they can't change. They can't. There's nothing in this situation. Something has to come in from the outside to fix it, to change it. And then you say to yourself, this is, I'm locking them into hell. I'm, I mm -hmm. am locking them into hell. Stop that. Stop that. You know, don't lock them into hell and say, you don't understand. You don't know. Who, who knows? Right. Who knows what can happen? Exactly. You don't know. And then, but bring in the Holy Spirit. It's not just who knows and drop them off on the 13th floor. Exactly. You know. Yeah. No, I know. No, you must call in the Holy Spirit. And then you do the, the, the Holy Spirit's work in that way. Okay, let's go on to paragraph five. You see what you expect, and you expect what you invite. Your perception is the result of your invitation coming to you as you sent for it. Whose manifestations would you see? Of whose presence would you be convinced? For you will believe in what you manifest, and as you look out, so, you, so will you see in. Two ways of looking at the world are in your mind, and your perception will reflect the guidance you have chosen. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can look one way or the other. I'm right. going to paragraph six. Right. I am the manif I I am the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And when you see me, it will be because you have invited him, for he will send you his witnesses if you will but look upon them. Remember always that you see what you seek, for what you seek you will find. The ego finds what it seeks, and only that. It does not find love, for that's not what it is seeking. Yet seeking and finding are the same. And if you seek for two goals, you will find them, but you will recognize neither. You will think they are the, you will think they are the same because you want both of them. The mind always strives for integration. And if it is split and wants to keep the split, it will still believe it has one goal by making it seem to be one. Yeah. We're getting we, some we heavy... We live in that split mind Well, we're getting some heavy mind hardware instruction, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I agree. So what do, you, what do you think? Just take a shot at it. Split mind, two goals. Can you think of any that you had ever? Two goals that you held at once? And Oh, well, I don't know if I can think of a specific one, but I know that I do... Um, I would say that whenever I feel any form of anxiety at all, it's because I am split between two goals. I like to use time-based things where, um, let's say I'm, I'm late, which I'm late a lot. <laughs> you know, I'm always those five minutes late type of thing. So I'm split between the goal of wanting my time and then having to be on time somewhere. And so I, I can't, there's, a, there's no way to have a resolution there. I, I can't come to a resolution because I've already decided that, well, first of all, I'm going to be late because it's just what well, I forget something as I'm walking out the door or something. And then I, and I don't judge for that. Well, at any rate, there's a sense that there's always an inner conflict that I could say, um, well, it doesn't matter that I'm late. Everyone's always talking when I'm going to get to that particular meeting anyway. It doesn't matter, you know, or whatever. I can make my judgments on what needs to um, to verify, but I'm still going to feel guilty. There'll be some kind of sense of not being true to myself in the situation. You know, if I think, uh, you know, this is the one that came to mind, and, you know, sort of immediately I could get into like work scenarios or different kinds of scenarios, but I'm going to use this one as a as a, a demo for this mm -hmm. principle of seeing two two goals, having two. Uh, yeah, seeking two separate goals. Mm -hmm. And then when they manifest, I cannot recognize either because I've chosen two. And because I have act, in fact chosen to keep a split mind, okay, because I've chosen to keep a split mind, I will see, that's the choice I made. Mm -hmm. I didn't choose either goal. I chose to keep a split mind. That's the one decision I did make. Yeah. And when you choose to keep a split mind, you are choosing with the ego. 
because that is the modus operandi of the ego. Right. Seek, but do not find. Seek, but do not find. Right. Always keep it. Partial hangout. Keep some of it hidden. So when I ch- see two goals, so let's take person uh, A. You know, mm-hmm. there's a person. And I say to myself, this person cannot experience, you know, I look at them and I say, they are living a life that's truncated. They're living a life that's partial. They're living a life that's not happy, joyful, and it seems doomed because of the hardware they've been, they've adopted or been given or the software or the whatever it is that they've got. And, and I see no reason for it. It's not like I want someone with no legs to be a pole vaulter. You know, as someone, this person has the equipment to, to my mind, mm-hmm. but I, I see them always in a perpetual state of not achieving a life that's vital and alive, okay? Now, I have a split mind because I want them to stay that way. Do you understand? I want them. I might throw on to them. So that you can be right about so your I judgment. So I can be right mm-hmm. so that my own sense of the, the stability of the world going ahead Like, yeah, sure, man, you nailed it. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that are just laws of physics. This person cannot emerge from their cocoon, let's say. They can't do it. They can't go anywhere. And I want both. I want them to change, and I don't want them to change. And why don't you want them to change? Isn't I don't want them to change for my own, because rightness makes me feel like I understand my world. I feel safer okay, in my world. That's what I, I just wanted you to verify. I that. feel safer in my world mm-hmm. when I can be right, even yes. if it has to do with a person be, ha, living a stilted life. I yes. feel better uh-huh. if they remain stilted. I've got to mm-hmm. be honest with myself. Right. Now, at the same time, I want them to have this happy life. Those are my two goals. Mm-hmm. I've chosen to keep a split mind. And instead of turning this over to the Holy Spirit, which is, by the way, as I'm discussing it, I am right now. Mm-hmm. I'm turning it over to the Holy Spirit right yes. now. Because of that split mind, I will, I would not, and I have not over a long period of time, been able to recognize movement either way. I, it's, it's, it's in uh, limbo. Mm-hmm. Th- that situation is in limbo. Heaven is a decision I must make. We are all healed together, you know. So, in this moment, I have to make the decision. Phil, do you want to see a miracle? Do you do you want to see a miracle? Do, do, do you believe that the Holy Spirit can show you a miracle, and you lose your sense of stability about being right mm-hmm. about the difficulties of the world? Yeah, that's a good example because I I understand where I hold on to those same kind of judgments and. Um, preconceived ideas about people and situations and it will I can't get to see the miracle under those circumstances I've I've held on to my my rightness about what I'm perceiving well in this given situation Mm -hmm. I I will keep you posted Mm -hmm. I will I'm yeah it's on my mind map yeah okay there okay I said before that what you project or extend is up to you but you must do one or the other for that is the law of the mind and you must look in before you look out. As you look in, you choose the guide for seeing, and then you look out and behold his witnesses. This is why you find what you seek. What you want in yourself, you will make manifest, and you will accept it from the world because you put it there by wanting it. When you think you are projecting what you do not want, it is still because you do want it. This leads directly to dissociation, for it represents the acceptance of two goals, each perceived in a different place, separated from each other because you made them different. The mind then sees a divided world outside itself, but not within. This gives it an illusion of integrity and enables it to believe that it is pursuing one goal. Yet as long as you perceive the world is split, you are not healed. For to be healed is to pursue one goal because you've accepted only one and want but one. Well, wow. I mean, we kind of covered a lot of this. Um, and um, obviously you behold the witnesses depending on which voice I am looking to have as my guide. 
my ego's voice. Jesus said earlier, paragraph six, I, I meant to say this, I am the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And when you see me, that's Jesus. Mm -hmm. It will be because you have invited him. That's the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yes. So we've, we've got some very clear guidance Absolutely. about what you're talking about. Yes. So I will choose. Um, the idea is for me, to, if I want a, a holy outcome, I will choose my guide as the Holy Spirit, as Jesus. I, the, that is my choice. And then if I'm, if I'm being honest and I really am choosing that, I will see the witnesses that bear the choice that I made as my guide. There, is, there are so many situations. I mean, I could probably write down on a legal pad. I could probably write down, I don't know, if I got started, I don't know, I might be able to come up with literally hundreds of things that need healing. Mm -hmm. You know, like that, in terms of the Course in Miracles and all this. Now, I just, within myself, I just want to say this, I listened through the ears of someone, let's say, tuning into the whole Course in Miracles thing. It sounds like la-la land. Yeah. There's a very interesting thing that we're asked to do here in terms of la-la land versus grim reality mm -hmm. uh, or heaven versus grim reality. Right now, lacking commitment, a person will listen and say, um, I need to hold on to grim reality because it's real. Mm -hmm. That's really why that's why you hold right. on to grim reality. Yeah. Grim I reality need, being my perceptual world. Yeah, yeah. Grim reality, the perceptual world. But the, the, people fall down, people get hurt, life's hard. Mm -hmm. Life is hard. Now, on the other side of it is this uh, heaven where you've got, okay, angels and harps. Beautiful idea. I want to hold on to that beautiful idea of angels and harps. I want to hold on to that. Um, because it, life seems empty without it. So I want to keep both. And within myself, I think that I'm, I'm unified within myself, that I'm a clear thinker with some optimism. That's what I think. Yeah. But in fact, what I've done is said, I'm choosing to keep my schizophrenic split, that I am a victim of circumstances here, and I want to irrationally believe that I am not a victim of circumstances here. Good point. Very, very good uh, example. As, uh, I, I, I agree. And you said it to me very, very well. So when we say this in La La Land, when we find ourselves, you know, I'm, I I'm just saying I wouldn't call heaven this. La La Land. No, no, I'm, I'm calling it La La Land because if I tuned in for the first time and I hear a bunch of people crooning about, about heaven, heaven and how great it can be and all that kind of stuff, okay. you say, come on, wake up, smell the coffee. There's mm -hmm. a lot of problems here. This is about looking up. It's about the direction of your gaze. It's not about me changing reality. It's about me lacking judgments. It's about me lacking projections and looking upward to the only vision I really, really want. I don't want the downward gaze, but I keep it because I think it's real. Right. So, so, so mm -hmm. you, there is the decision. You know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm burdened by the, the lesson today. Heaven yes. is the decision I, I must, must make. make. Yes, yes. It doesn't mean being unrealistic. It just means mm -hmm. where are you going to look? Mm -hmm. Which place are you mm -hmm. going to look for yeah. your answers? Right, and as long as I perceive that my world is um, the one that I'm perceiving through my eyes and all my senses and what is coming through me on flat screens and whatnot, if I make that my value, they talk about what's value valuable and what's valueless over the true uh, reality, which the Holy Spirit is constantly holding out its hand to me. I can get depressed. I can get anxious. I can think there are things I must do to protect my little turf in the world from whatever's coming at me. As soon as I go there, I am denying and I am I'm not choosing heaven I'm not choosing the heavenly answer the Holy Spirit's answer anymore that's I've immediately said I better take care of this or this and this isn't going to go right I better take care of this or this and this isn't going to happen and so um I what would you say is the best way that when when anxiety starts to proceed from those places because it seems like we're you're not being responsible in the ways of the world. Sometimes when things, knowledge comes at you and you say, well, with that knowledge, I should be up to this, you know? 
And I'm almost going to answer my own question because I recognize also that if I'm in a prayerful way with the Holy Spirit throughout the day, I will recognize that I've given, been given an answer, even under my anxious uh, dilemma there. If suddenly some other piece of information, some other situation comes in and I'm, I feel suddenly at peace with something, I go, oh, I wasn't expecting that. That takes care of X, Y, Z. Two things. Uh, one is uh, Ulysses. Uh, literally Ulysses when he's on his boat and he's and he's wandering around after the Trojan War and he's on his boat and there's a scene where he goes to the the sirens and they're on the rocks and everyone knows that the sirens have such a beautiful song that you will be drawn to the rocks okay Mm -hmm. that is the screen that is the news that you will be drawn to the rocks because you're going to hear people that have been trained and paid to convince you that the world is going straight to hell in the manner that they prescribe. Mm-hmm. That's what you're going to hear. That's what you're going to see. And you are Ulysses. You are being drawn to the rocks. And like Ulysses, your boat, which is what you do and how you react and the waves you're sailing on, you tell your men, wax your ears. Do not listen to me howl when I start screaming to go to the rocks. Tie me to the mast. And don't let me go, no matter how I beg, no matter what rationale I use. And so they did. They went by. But he wanted to hear the song. Ulysses wanted to hear the song and the sirens and had to pay the price of the agony of, of, of not being able to wreck himself on the rocks. Mm-hmm. So you'd say he gained some knowledge. Anyway, that go with you want with that one. But the other one is... <laughs> was uh, in Young Frankenstein. Okay. Dr. Big switch. No, okay. no, it's not that big of a switch. Oh, okay. Dr. Frankenstein is going to work with a monster, okay? The monster that he has created. This is uh, Gene Wilder yes. as, as Frankenstein. And he's, and he's like, I'm going to heal him, oh, the monster. Yeah, so he needs love. He needs care. I'm going in there. And no matter what... I say, <laughs> oh, that's a no great matter scene. what I do, no matter what, I, keep the door locked. Do not open the door. Do you hear me? He gets the agreement from the girl. He gets the agreement from Igor and the other. And they're just saying, oh, you're so brave that you're going in mm-hmm. to heal this beast, you know. Yes. And um, he goes in, closes the door, and the monster just grunts. And he turns and he looks at the door. He starts pounding on it. Open the goddamn door! I know. <laughs> he starts pounding and pounding and pounding on the door. And he won't. But because he told them, they would not open the door. So he's forced to deal with that situation. That's mm-hmm. the that's the other way. <laughs> that's the other way that things will not go very well. Anyway, I apologize. I don't that's know if that one goes to the the healing, the healing there. Uh, no, well, okay, he's caught in a situation. We're caught okay. in a situation. I mean, uh-huh. if I have to go into the, yeah, you know, yeah. my, G- my give, give the courses creature up. mode. The, the, the course version is, okay, Gene Wilder goes in. He says, don't let me out of here. Mm-hmm. In other words, there's no escape, mm-hmm. okay? No escape. Uh, it's a funny bit that he does. But the world we're in, if you do not choose your escape, or if you just seal off escape, Escape into other people's opinion, escape into your own moods, escape into your own depressions, escape into your own judgments Mm -hmm. of what's going on. If you're going to hear that, a groan of the monster, and you think that, you know, he's going to beat the hell out of you, you know, when you hear that and you just say, no, I'm going to make peace with this thing. And he does because the thing is going to twist his head off, Mm -hmm. the monster. Mm -hmm. He starts talking to him, Mm -hmm. saying, you know, it's a funny scene. You got to watch it. It's actually quite (laughs) hilarious. Uh, But anyway, so in our lives, if you lock yourself in to the message that's being given here, Jesus said it, I am the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. When you see me, it will be because you invited him. Yes. So when Gene Wilder, I don't mean to drag this thing in. It's like the it's worst okay. form of fundamentalist preacher. But um, it will be because it means that he has to invite in Gene Wilder, the Holy Spirit, in other words, to walk his talk. 
which is that this monster is essentially good mm-hmm. and that he's the one that's going to draw it out of him. Mm-hmm. He has to do that. And when he makes that decision, invites him in, mm-hmm. the monster does actually wear the face of Christ. I mean, if you've got to go... Yeah, okay, I, I, okay. I apologize yeah, no, for no, taking no, no, young I Frankenstein. Think, no, no, I think it's actually... I, I just wanted to have resolution because I know that... No, I know. I go off and then drop it like, and then a, drop it. <laughs> like a cold potato. Okay. Uh, um, paragraph 8. Mm-hmm. When you want only love, you will see nothing else. The contradictory nature of the witnesses you perceive is merely the reflection of your conflicting invitations. You have looked upon your mind and accepted opposition there, having sought it there. But do not then believe that the witnesses for opposition are true, for they attest only to your decision about reality, returning to you the messages you gave them. Love, too, is recognized by its messengers. If you make love manifest, its messengers will come to you because you invited them. Yeah, that's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, get ready. So go ahead. Yeah. Paragraph 9. The power of decision is your one remaining freedom as a prisoner of this world. You can decide to see it right. What you made of it is not its reality. For its reality is only what you give it. You cannot really give anything but love to anyone or anything, nor can you really receive anything but love from them. If you think you have received anything else, it is because you have looked within and thought you saw the power to give something else within yourself. Let me read that again. If you think you have received anything else, it is because you have looked within and thought you saw the power to give something else within yourself. It is only this decision that determined what you found, for it was the decision for what you sought. Um, This, uh, you know, I I can only emphasize that the the Course makes specific about decision-making that you will decide for the ego or you will decide for the Holy Spirit. You will decide for pain or you will decide for joy. You will decide or, or healing. You'll decide for, um, you know, death or you'll decide for life. Each one is, you'll know by your witnesses what kind of decision you've made. Um, now, I don't know if I understood that one sentence there. If you think you have received anything else, it's because you looked within and thought you saw the power to give something else within yourself. So something in myself I'm giving power to. Um, that you could give something other than love. Oh, 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 I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because there's only, only love is what is really manifest at any time. And whenever I see anything else... Um, I have, I have chosen a perceptual reality. Okay. Another based... one of those sentences, I know I'm interrupting you, no, but, it's go like, ahead. but this is one of those things you cannot really give anything but love to anyone or anything, nor can you really receive anything but love from them. Mm-hmm. Tell me that doesn't sound absolutely ludicrous. Tell, it's a nice, nice phrase, mm-hmm. nice turn of phrase. Mm-hmm. What does it mean? It means in reality, reality itself has no opposite. So whenever I'm seeing anything else uh, in my perceptual world that is not love or loving, then I'm actually seeing um, what I have made, or you know, collectively. It, I, I don't, I don't know uh, if I. I just heard a, I just heard a debate. That, but it, you, you know what I mean. Where um, I have now enjoined my mind. With a death cult, usually it's it's something related to the body is vulnerable, other bodies are vulnerable, and I, all of it is about protecting those bodies, ones out there that I see that need protected, and my own that I need to be protected. Well, less, le- really, believe it or not, I mean, less complex than that. Okay. Um, I just heard two guys that was chris langan and bernardo i forget his last name and they were having an argument and bernardo was saying you know the the question from the questioner uh this indian guy that does the podcast uh he asks um some people say basically love is the foundation of the world and bernardo is saying uh it's a nice thought nice idea yeah uh i don't think so 
I, I wouldn't put it that way because there's proofs everywhere to the contrary. I mean, mm-hmm. there's just so much stuff going on that's not love that there's no way. And you could say the same thing about your head. You look inside your head, and you say, well, there's a lot going on in there, mm-hmm. but it's not all love. The Course is saying it is love. Okay, it is. I don't care what you find in there. It is but- love. Now, how does that happen? This is how it happens is that we are here for the healing of the sonship. That's it. That's all there is. If we make that decision to look towards the nightmare of the world or the ego's mind, we're only choosing to a split mind. We're choosing to be conflicted. We're choosing these things. It's all the waiting room. It's all Neo at the train station, Mm -hmm. stuck there for all time until somebody gets him out. And that's the Holy Spirit in the Matrix movie. Mm -hmm. Or he's stuck there forever. Mm -hmm. So that's us. We are stuck here. As long as we keep choosing grim reality, uh, weighing this and that, we don't know how this is going to go. We don't know how it's going to play because life has its vagaries. As long as we keep that very adult mindset, um, we will see something other than love in our mind. And what the Course is saying here is, Everything that comes out of you, number one, if it's if it's an ex, if it's a real extension, because you've made you've invited the Holy Spirit in, then obviously you're extending love, which is the healing. Mm-hmm. But let's say you don't do that, and let's say you find something else in your mind and you throw it out there into the world. In the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, it is reinterpreted somewhere, sometime, somehow, in some cycle of wisdom so that we will get out of here as it says in the course early on this thing comes to an end it does not go on indefinitely we will all get there it's just a matter of are you going to help are you going to hurt you know and if you're going to hurt it just makes it the time longer that there's only one decision to make and that's heaven you can't decide for a lack of freedom you can't decide to be in hell you can't, you, no right. one in their right mind. That if you decide for a lack of freedom or if you decide to be in hell or if you decide against God or if you decide against love or if you decide against the Holy Spirit, it's because you don't understand. I agree. The Course says it. You mm-hmm. wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. So in this case, when you look in your mind, you have to realize a priori, anything I have that's a real contribution to anything is love. There's nothing else to contribute. And if I look in there and I find something other than love, I haven't found anything. That's right. It's a nothing. I haven't found anything. Right. So that's why this is always true. Yes, that's right. This is always true. Okay. It's like, okay, let's say I'm at the bus station. Let's say I am Neo in the waiting, in the waiting room and that he has to make an invitation to uh, Morpheus to come get him out, let's say. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he's sitting there, and he can sit there and sit there and sit there, and he can try the exits, and he can try to get on trains, and he can try, and he, he's not going to get out mm-hmm. until he says, Morpheus, get me out of here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he only has one choice right. of right. nothing, which is hanging out in the train station mm-hmm. forever, or inviting in someone who's from the outside, who can pull him out of this situation. Correct. You understand? I do. There's not two choices. There's only one choice. I do. I do understand. And the choice is always to escape prison. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And and you recognize also that um, it's a self-made prison because you always had the choice to get out, but you didn't choose it. So then you stay in prison. Paragraph 10. You are afraid of me because you looked within and are afraid of what you saw. Yet you could not have seen reality, for the reality of your mind is the loveliest of God's creations. Coming only from God, its power and grandeur could only bring you peace if you really looked upon it. If you are afraid, it is because you saw something that is not there. Yet in that same place, you could have looked upon me and all your brothers, in the perfect safety of the mind which created us. For we are there in the peace of the Father who wills to extend his peace through you. Yeah, and again, all of this has to do with my awareness of, uh, you know, make, first of all, making that decision, and then the awareness that peace doesn't ever change. The loving aspects of life do not change. They are, they are in the mind of God, and they are always there. 
It's only me blocking that peace, that love, that joy. It's only me blocking it because I've decided to look upon this other reality, that said, that uh, this other thing that it says it is not there. And it's not there because God is all. And because it is all, there is nothing that is unlike itself. So when I see and experience things unlike the all that is, which is God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus, if you want to put them all in that one place, then, which they are, they are the same. I am also the same. I am the same as that because I was created in the likeness and image. So whenever I, I'm looking within and I see something different, I'm not seeing the truth of who I am. I'm, I'm looking upon a no thing, a something that I think is real, but is not. True or false? Uh, most people are really afraid of relationship. I would say most people are afraid of relationship. And could I even say everyone is afraid of relationship? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that that is, you know, pretty common. We could say, no, I'm not, and, and everything else. But Why? I would say. Why, when a person craves the loving support of another person, uh, a, a beautiful interaction somehow, supportive, you know, stuff. Why would they be afraid of a relationship? Because they're afraid that that other person is going to see what we perceive negatively about ourselves. You're afraid of that they're going to see inside of you what you think is in there. Yes. And uh-huh. if they see nothing but pearls and, and gold doubloons, <laughs> then you're afraid they're going to turn out to be not as good as you thought, You know, which is also, I, I saw something nasty within, so I project that out. Yes. I'm going to find something nasty without. Therefore, I fear relationship because I feel like I'm going to find something nasty. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's what Jesus says right here, right? Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing as just looking within my own self. It's the same thing as what you just said. And and that also is a good example because um, it says that I'm afraid of my relationship with God, with the Holy Spirit, whatever. In other words, you you, you have to recognize you're afraid of the light. I'm afraid of the light That's that right. is the same as me. I'm yeah. afraid of that because yeah. the, then Holy, the, the the course says that the, I'm throughout. afraid of the dark, and the only thing I'm more afraid of than the dark is the it's light. Only, because then the identity that I had perceived and made of myself in this world goes away. It 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 actually becomes really joyful. But it, the what the other thing that I thought I was. My gig. Yeah, it goes away. Yeah, right. I'm in somebody else's <laughs> groovy thing, but That's it's right. not mine. You know, and it's, that was in whatever. Uh, who was it that told, you know, in that I, I would rather serve in, I would rather uh, rule in hell than serve in heaven. It's from like Dante's Inferno oh, or something right. like that. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to chap- I mean, uh, paragraph 11. When you have accepted your mission to extend peace... You will find peace, for by making it manifest, you will see it. Its holy witnesses will surround you because you called upon them, and they will come to you. I have heard your call, and I have answered it. But you will not look upon me, nor hear the answer that you sought. That is because you do not yet want only that. Yet, as I become more real to you, you will learn that you do want only that. And you will see me as you look within, and you will look upon the real... And we will. Uh, okay, and we will look upon the real world together. Through the eyes of Christ, only the real world exists, and only the real world can be seen. As you decide, so you will see, and all that you see but witnesses to your decision. That's beautiful. But in, and again, there is absolutes in all of this readings and the lessons. It's absolutely that if you want to see it, you have to want only that. And the recognition that I did not want only that comes back to me because I get to see the witnesses that I've chosen in the world and I'll feel 
not at peace. Oh. I'm going I'm to go back to my tired uh, metaphor of having a car that's out of whack, and I've got a neighbor that's a good mechanic. Mm -hmm. And um, I want that engine fixed, but I refuse to call the mechanic. Yeah, I, I can that's want, a good example. I can, want the, mm -hmm. I can want the engine fixed all day, but I got the mechanic next door. Mm -hmm. Until I choose to call that mechanic. I'm just saying that because this is an aspect of the course I haven't really paid that much attention to, and it's not really advertised that much. There's quite a bit of relationship here god is a who mm -hmm. jesus is his you know face in this and if we see if we call on the holy spirit we see the face of christ and therefore see jesus and therefore we can recognize the mind of god yes so it's a relationship this stuff doesn't happen in a little kit a little box that we peel open and you know it's like mm -hmm. a like we're in grade school and you open it up and there's some crayons in there and some, you know, some erasers and pencils and stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can do your work in private, separate. No, the, the kit that you open up is a relationship. Right. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, um, well, I don't know if there's anything else. I had a thought, but it's disappeared. So I'm just going to let you go on. I sent it away. <laughs> Paragraph 12, when you look within and see me, it will be because you have decided to manifest truth. And as you manifest it, you will see it both within, without, and within. And as you manifest it, you will see it both without and within. You will see it without because you saw it first within. Everything you behold without is a judgment of what you beheld within. If it is your judgment, it will be wrong. For judgment is not your function. If it is the judgment of the Holy Spirit, it will be right. For judgment is his function. You share his function only by judging as he does, reserving no judgment at all for yourself. You will judge against yourself, but he will judge for you. If I exercise judgment, it goes poorly. If I turn it over to the Holy Spirit, and in fact, I'm predisposed to forgive, it will go well. Yes, absolutely. And that's really what that is. I mean, be aware is, or beware of our judgments because if we're not asking for the Holy Spirit's judgment, it's probably not going to go r well. Not internally. I'll have some anxiety or something or some other thing. Or it's not well, gonna... I have preferences. You know, I mean, I'm going to yeah. have preferences about people and flavors and, and situations. Mm -hmm. Um, but to recognize those are simply my preferences and not to make them value judgments on reality. It's one thing to have preferences. I'm allowed to have preferences. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And just don't be too attached to them. So then other things can happen that, are, that might be better. <laughs> yeah, like I don't like the way that, let's say, the Empire State Building looks. <laughs> yeah. You know, I would have preferences. But don't yeah. get attached to it. Don't get engaged because yes. it's just some dumb idea you got because it's not going anywhere yet, you know, until King Kong shows up. Go ahead. Yes, okay. Paragraph 13. Remember, then, that whenever you look without and react unfavorably to what you see, you have judged yourself unworthy and have condemned yourself to death. The death penalty is the ego's ultimate goal, for it fully believes that you are a criminal, as deserving of death as God knows you are deserving of life. The death penalty never leaves the ego's mind, for that is what it always reserves for you in the end, wanting to kill you as the final expression of its feeling for you. It lets you live to await death. It will torment you while you live, but its hatred is not satisfied until you die. For your destruction is the one end toward which it works, and the only end with which it will be satisfied. Yeah, you, wow, that's grim, huh? Don't you think it's pretty funny? Yeah, I do, actually. I and it's pretty smile. funny because we just got through this lovely thing about Jesus. And, funny, and then Jesus shows up and goes, oh, that ego. Oh, it just wants you to die. I know. I know. I like to think of it that it doesn't really quite, it wants to keep me like barely alive, just barely, barely, because yeah. it needs a body. But it wants, it definitely does not have any of my best interests in mind. And... um that that takes work to have recognition that really it has nothing beneficial for me even though i think my rightness about certain things is valid 
it's no, it won't do me no good. Is it go, and we go back to uh, you're afraid of me because you looked within or afraid of what you saw, the sphere of relationship, mm -hmm. um, why it's difficult for me to get away from the split mind and choose heaven, it's the decision I must make, and all these kinds of things. It's because I really quite don't trust you know, the, you know, it's like, what, what is that thing they say? Uh, God is my co-pilot. And mm -hmm. then people say, mm -hmm. why the hell is God your co-pilot? I mean, he ought to be the pilot. <laughs> oh, right. Absolutely. God is the, po co is the pilot and you're the co-pilot. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it's, it, it, it's just interesting because now we've got this death thing. This really grim death penalty. Ego's ultimate goal. Really, do you believe that? Just let's think about it for a second, because it's kind of, I'm, I'm actually laughing about it, but it, it, it's not funny. No, I know. And if I could truly recognize it, I probably would be in tears that I put myself through all of that. Okay, well, let's just take, take an isolated situation that, where the ego is played in your life or whatever, and, and, it, and you come up with a death penalty. Well, my last relationship before I met you, <laughs> I came up with my own death penalty. In fact, I did not want to li live but it. But by inches. Yeah, by inches, by inches, by inches through the relationship. I, I condemned myself by not being of value anymore based on things that were happening. And I did not, I did not want to live. I, I could have taken my, I thought I could have almost taken my own life. But, and uh, my ego was definitely, I mean, you're talking about going down, down, down into the deep, darkest depths and finding that um, I literally had to reach out a couple of times. I mean, right before I went into the hospital, because I had created my own, you know, disaster at that point. And, um, and that, when I did call on Jesus to, to help me through, I helped, and I actually felt him walking beside me, if that's possible. <laughs> and, um, but at any rate, yeah, it was the... Um, I had lost the ability to see the light within my own self after I had had so many glorious light, you know, this other, the complete opposite. I went completely down to the bottom of the well. And um, I can only say that there was a decision. And the decision was to please send me someone to reflect the light that I once knew. And voila, you showed up. <laughs> well, so, you, you have a dramatic story. Yeah. You have a, that's a, actually, you have a dramatic story about that well, kind of thing. Well, sometimes this is drama here. I'm no, talking I know, about but drama. I, but I'm thinking about some people, you know, near and dear, who it's less dramatic. Mm -hmm. That, that they're, not, uh, they're not committed enough to hurl themselves into, let's say, a truly destructive relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not even, they're not that committed to their own, let's say, destruction or their own ugliness or whatever to throw themselves into that kind of projection. And instead, it's a kind of an isolated, truncated existence, mm -hmm. as I was talking about before. There's a, there's an isolation and a sense of not, you know, wanting help. It's like being at the bottom of a well. Mm -hmm. And this is like a, almost a genetic legacy in my mm -hmm. family mm -hmm. of being at the bottom of a very dry well and just not wanting to either put people out up at the top of the well to drag you out mm -hmm. or, or, or not, wanting to, not wanting to humiliate yourself by calling for help. Mm -hmm. And so you just keep kind of fiddling around and they're trying all these different ways to get out of the well over and over. And you've exhausted the same three ways over and over and over and over again and you keep hoping that somebody that some i don't know what some person will look down in the dry well and and you stay there so that you die slowly 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 for a lack of of being too pride too proud to call for help yeah too proud to recognize you can't get out of the well right right yeah i tend to throw myself at things completely so i get both extremes <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, that's, that's actually, um, where Jesus says, be ye hot or cold, or I will spit ye out of my mouth. Because unless you go to, you know, the extreme other, there is a sense that you can't recognize it's, it's the alcoholic who manages to stay at work 
get jobs done, da 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 da. Things are just so so at home. And then he has his drinks, but he still manages to go through stuff and everything else. He will never recognize that he's sedating himself against his own spirit that would be enlivened to another direction. It's the one who fall who just who wrecks the relationship entirely, wrecks the car, wrecks everything else, comes out of it, goes to AA, and finally goes, I need to see another way. That you know, unfortunately. But you um, can't you know, but this world and this the situation in the world can actually turn a person sort of into a golem, you know, where they're just they're a a creature mm -hmm. that lives from one mechanical goal to the next. I agree. And and that what keeps them glued together, as I said before, is a sense of self hatred, but pride. Mm -hmm. You know, amazingly, that's that split mind. Yeah. How can you have? How can you? How can you have pride? And self-loathing simultaneously. Interesting. It happens isn't it? a lot. It happens. Though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Paragraph fourteen: The ego is not a traitor to God, to whom treachery is impossible, but it is a traitor to you who believe that you have been treacherous to your father. That is why the undoing of guilt is an essential part of the Holy Spirit's teaching. For as long as you feel guilty, you are listening to the voice of the ego which tells you that you have been treacherous to God and therefore deserve death. You will think that death comes from God and not from the ego, because by confusing yourself with the ego, you believe that you want death, and from what you want, God does not save you. Hmm. So, okay, that's a grim line. Mm -hmm. Back to the bottom of the well. Back to you are afraid of me because you looked within at the in in paragraph ten, and from and from what you want, God does not save you. God will not overtake my freedom. That's right. I know. So you gotta man wake up. You gotta what wake you're asking up. For. That's right. Yeah. For as long as you gu feel guilty, you are listening to the voice of the ego, which is an interesting thing because I mean, being Catholic and everything, <laughs> the guilt is part of what we think is... Um, Pain and guilt is your secret pleasure. Well, yeah, it's a secret pleasure, and it means that I'm being somehow humble and self-flagellant, you know, so therefore, you know, I will get my graces in God because I recognize my sinfulness. You know, that's a bit of a problem, but here it tells you if, you experience, if you're experiencing guilt, you're, you're being run by the voice of the ego. It's an important thing. Okay, guilt. Say a word about guilt. What about? I just did. When do you feel guilt? Do you when feel do you... guilt now? Do you feel guilt tomorrow? No. Do you feel guilt yesterday? When you... Um. Okay, let's take that thing with the turkey thing that we haven't oh, talked yes. about yet. Just yes. in that situation where there's a misunderstanding at Thanksgiving. What, yes. Where would the guilt factor the in? The guilt factor would have come in that um, I, I didn't recognize um, an outreach as a gift. I found it as an intrusion. You felt guilty that you wanted to have your way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what somebody else wanted you, to, quote, unquote, do for you. Yes, exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And that causes that inner turmoil and, and things like that. And then, you know, we did call upon the Holy Spirit and everything worked out perfectly. But um, I just, uh, yes, that, that guilt does, will arise in those, in those types of situations because, well, I am wanting it. My I way. think to recognize guilt is important because a lot of times we have guilt tied up with morality. Mm -hmm. And like, as an example, let's say we're, we're doing this podcast thing mm -hmm. right now. I have a vague feeling that I should be attending to some drawings. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that. And that's a guilt. Yeah. And so, and it's a really slow burn. I mean, it's really, really a small burn on the back burner. It's, there's nothing big about it. But according to the Course in Miracles, and if you're going to do this, I've got to recognize that, look within, and say, no, the miracle is the rearrangement of time and space. I've, I've experienced it way, Many way, times. way enough times Many to realize times. that it yes. is true. Mm -hmm. And that often when I feel guilty, I have, I'm, I'm feeling guilty about a situation that I myself invented, and it doesn't exist in real life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even exist in the illusion. Yeah. It's all totally in my head. You understand yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, I And do. therefore, I feel guilty about it. Oh, mm -hmm. that person expects this. Mm -hmm. 
the situation is that. Oh, they're going to think this about me. And it mm-hmm. leads to these guilt feelings. Yes. Anyway. A lot of that. Uh, they're going to think this about me. That's the one that causes guilty feelings a lot, you know? Yeah. So I, I project what another person might have judgments on me. And then, okay. Um, last paragraph. Last paragraph. Paragraph 15. When you're tempted to yield to the desire for death, remember that I did not die. You will realize that this is true when you look within and see me. Would I have overcome death for myself alone? And would eternal life have been given me of the Father unless he had also given it to you? When you learn to make me manifest, you will never see death. For you will have looked upon the deathless in yourself, and you will see only the eternal as you look out upon a world that cannot die. You know, when we go all the way back to the beginning, I I am, hold your thought, whatever it is, but we go back to the beginning of this fairly long chapter. Miracles demonstrate that learning has occurred under the right guidance, for learning is invisible, and what has been learned can be recognized only by its results. This is critical. This is critical to learn to recognize miracles, to ask for miracles, learn to recognize them. So you can have this recognition that Jesus did not die. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? Because if I'm looking historically for an empty tomb, Mm -hmm. or or, you know, I'm looking in a Bible or something, Mm -hmm. this this isn't about the Bible. No, it's not. This is about Jesus. This mm-hmm. is about Jesus. That's a relationship. That's a being. And the only way you can get to know a being is to invite them in. There's no proof of anybody. You know, frankly, there's no proof of you. I can't get to know your social security number. And that's the only proof there is. <laughs> I know. I can give you the social security number, but that will not tell you anything about me. No, the only proof of you oh. of, of that is your presence. Oh, mm-hmm. You, mm-hmm. right here, mm-hmm. is the only proof. And even then, until I make a decision to let the, the sort of the, uh, the flesh case open up mm-hmm. and recognize the communion is not about two you know, descriptive blobs of skin looking at each other. You know, yeah. it's, it's the qualities within. It's exploring the qualities within and without and, and, and letting that merge in a, conv- in a conversation, in a relationship. We have to go through that with Jesus. And the only way that we can go through that without feeling like we're just cheating reality, which is the, the grim reality, right? The grim reality is that the only way we can get away from feeling like we're cheating our adult selves, which know better than this, is to learn to recognize miracles. Ask mm-hmm. for them. Start to, one has to recognize miracles. I don't know any other way. Because if I reserve the right to do the Course in Miracles mm-hmm. without a miracle... That's, that's silly. That's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah, it is. I just like to remember that I did not die. I mean, because there is an emphasis that Jesus died and then he rose from the dead. But the fact is, is that as a recognition that he already was one with God, he knows he is an eternal being. If he, okay. And he could not have believed in death even as he was on the cross. If he died, mm-hmm. in other words, his life terminated, mm-hmm. and then he rose from the dead, uh, we got a schizo situation happening. You know, it's, it's typical. It's typical because death is the end. He's saying, I didn't die. He didn't right. say, I rose. He said, no. I didn't die. Because if you died, and then boing, 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 you back up again, it's like one of them... You know, those those balloon clowns that you punch over and it always comes back up again. <laughs> right. You know, if you knock out mm-hmm. Jesus and he pops back up again, mm-hmm. that means he didn't die. Right. That means what you're calling death is something else. Exactly. And that's what I think he wanted us to recognize, and it just never came across. So we have death. He died for us. And then he rose from the dead. Wow, and you've got to be uncool enough to talk about Jesus all over the place. If you're paying attention to this book, Jesus drags himself in all over the yeah, place. Yeah, there's a lots of eyes, and, and where the, there is the eye, it is Jesus speaking. Mm-hmm. Or, the you know, he identifies only as the Christ at this point. So we identify him as an individuated uh, being that is 
you know, the, a historical it was a body and now is no longer a body. But he wants us all to recognize that we cannot die. It's impossible. Once we enter into a relationship with him, that eternity is a, an awareness that comes back to me. I know my eternal self. And when I know it completely, well, I don't know what I end up seeing in the world because I have not been there. But if I know it completely, I would say that my perceptual reality changes completely. What, in the case of? In the case of recognizing that I am an eternal being at one with Father. That is the atonement, and I cannot die. And I'm going to say that one of the uh, fringe benefits or hidden benefits of the miracle is that it leaves, whether you like it or not, a residual of that very knowledge. I agree. With every miracle. Yeah. Every miracle will leave a little residual. Mm -hmm. What it says, we leave cookies. Oh, yeah. You know, do you agree to these cookies? Mm -hmm. And the cookies in this situation is immortality. Yes. Yes. So, there we go. Great. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank That's you. It.